Uh, good morning and welcome to this session, the session two of our, our course, uh, Management of NGOs. And, and today we are going to be continuing from where we left off um, uh, the last time in, in session one. In that session, what we did was to get an understanding of what, or what type of organizations qualify to be called NGOs. And we went through quickly the definition of NGOs and, 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 and how uh, we can, the features of NGOs. In this session, we are going to continue that discussion. So we are looking generally at the context of NGOs. Uh, my name is Justice Bauli again, and um, I will be your tutor for this session. In this session, we would want you to be able to come along with uh, understanding a bit more some other classifications of NGOs and also to identify what um, the functions of NGOs are. Uh, we will also go through what the scope of NGOs activities have been. And so come along with me and please note that this is meant to be a continuation of the previous session. So you are supposed to come along with that, along those lines. Uh, don't hesitate to go back into your, your slides uh, occasionally to make reference if you need to make reference so you are able to follow the discussion well. And of course, I know that your tutors would be available to help you at some point if you need some more clarification. But for today's session, we are looking at the context of NGOs, so we're going to be looking at a bit more about the classification of NGOs and the scope of NGO activities and the relevance of NGOs in modern development. So we, we have talked about some classifications already, and when we did, we looked at classifications based on community, either an NGO is a community-based NGO, or it's, it's um, a national NGO or an international NGO. In Ghana, the Department of Social Welfare has jurisdiction over uh, the supervision of NGOs. So all NGOs will have to register with the Department of Social Welfare. Um, and, and, and that re uh, registration requires you to renew your registration every year. So if you are just thinking about forming your NGO, which is the, one of the key essence of this program, we, we want to encourage you to make sure that you have gone to the um, Department of Social Welfare in the district to be able to uh, register your NGO. You pick up a form and you register your NGO. Uh, when we get to creating an NGO, we will talk a little bit more about registering your NGO. But the Department of Social Welfare has its own categorization of NGOs. In other words, there are some classifications that you see. It says that NGOs can be categorized into four particular categories or types. There's community-based NGO, which we referred to earlier. There is also national NGO, which we referred to earlier. And then there is also what they call uh, national NGOs with international affiliates. So you get an NGO, like I mentioned, Challenging Heights, or Amasachina, which is in Tamale, um, has it's a national NGO. But they might have some affiliations with international organizations. And these affiliate affiliations would help them to be able to get resources from this uh, international organization. But there are also international NGOs that are operating locally. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, Well Vision, Plan Ghana are international NGOs, uh, but they have local offices in Ghana and they operate. So that is how uh, the Social Welfare Department classifies NGOs. But Salmo, uh, Stillman also has his own classification, and he also classified NGOs into four main families or groups. The first one, he calls them unincorporated associations. In other words, these are associations that are formed in the community and that is, they are not registered. So women's association, women's group, they don't register, they just meet, they agree that they have, uh, uh, they have common interests and they just meet to deal with issues. Um, sometimes if you, if you go to the communities, you find a small group of people, maybe Barber's Association, and they meet, they discuss issues related to them, they, don't, they are not registered. Uh, so they, there are no legal formalities for them to complete but they are just also a group of organizations. But he also talks about what are known as trust, charities, and foundations. And he says these ones are organizations that usually have some resources available, and they want to give that, those resources to people. Um, and these uh, charities, trust, or foundations are usually established by people who, have, who are accomplished, have made a lot of money, and they feel that they want to give up some of the money to society. So for example, you have Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has a lot of money to give to people or organizations to do work in different ways. They are also a category of NGOs. You can have the um, um, other foundation, Mo Ibrahim, Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which supports activities of governance in Africa, for example. That is a trust, a charity, or a foundation. 
but we also have what is known as a company not for profit, which is where typically our kind of NGOs that we have in Ghana will fit in. Companies that are established, they are limited by guarantee and they engage in activities uh, to be able to provide some support to some uh, communities or people in some organizations. And then we have also uh, entities formed or registered under special laws. In Ghana, when you go to the Registrar General's Department, and don't forget, let me just remind you that if you were to form your NGO, you need to go to the Registrar General's Department and to register your NGO before the Department of Social Welfare would even accept your uh, application for recognition and certification to operate. So, so under those laws, you can register your NGO as a company limited by guarantee, and you'll be required to operate based on the laws that govern companies limited by guarantee. And companies limited by guarantee means that it is, uh, um, it is the people who form it who have responsibility to service it if there are problems with it. So, so those are the four categorizations that Stillman uh, puts in place. Salomon is one very good writer. He's a very accomplished writer in the NGO terrain, uh, and he has his own classification, and he classifies NGOs in these ways. He uses what he calls the legal criteria, in which case he's looking at what is the legal form of a particular NGO. You can have NGOs with different legal forms, but he also has NGOs, he classifies NGOs based on economic criteria. So he says there are NGOs that will be engaged in different types of activities or income generating activities or areas of economic activity. He also classifies NGOs based on purpose. Are they established as NGOs to, to, for human rights activities? Are they established to support students with needs? What, what, what is the purpose for the NGO? And then he also talks about the structural or the operational uh, um, uh, type of NGOs that, that are grouped according to the structure or operations they undertake. So depending on the kind of operation or structure, they can group NGOs. For example, you can have NGOs that we talked about international. They operate in regions. They, operate, they have different structures. They have a tall bureaucratic structure and all of that. Now, once we have seen some classifications of NGOs, I'm sure that if I were to ask you to see whether or not the NGOs that operate in the area that you are, you might be able to come up with a different categorization or classification of these NGOs. You are at liberty to do that because that's the essence of this program, to make sure that you are able to come up with your own understanding of what exists within your society. Now, let's quickly look at what NGOs do. In other words, the scope of activities. So what do NGOs do? And I, I dare to say that NGOs can or have been engaged in virtually everything that exists on, on, on Earth. There are NGOs that are dedicated to looking at health of people and in health you can have different sets of activities that NGOs engage in. For example, you can have NGOs that, are in, that, that try to look at um, dementia cases, people who have physical disability. Uh, in Ghana you have saved the site, found, uh, saved the nation's uh, site of the nation foundation. You have NGOs that are dedicated to, to eyesight, to uh, uh, different types of diseases. So you can have NGOs that are, you know, in different types of activities. Um, so we say that often when we're looking at the scope of NGO activities, it is as much to say that NGOs activities can stretch from everything, development, through religion, to politics, um, to health, to environment, uh, to culture. And so you can have NGOs that are dedicated to issues of religion. So you have, for example, the World Jewish Congress, which is a congress of people who believe in the Jewish tradition. We can have the International Muslim Union, which is, we can have the International Olympic Society. The, the, you know the Olympics is a non-profit, it's, it's an NGO. So we have the International Olympic Society. We have the socialist movement. So when we talk about the activities and scope of activities of NGOs, it expands everywhere. There are NGOs that uh, specialize in looking at issues of culture, so, for example, people are getting educated to stay away from female genital mutilation, which is a cultural issue. There are NGOs that are, are specialized in, in, in talking to people to avoid early child marriages and, 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 and polygamy and stuff like that. There are NGOs that are, for example, helping some communities to go away from some traditional obnoxious practices, for example, and all of that. We have NGOs that are engaged in international human rights fights. So you have, for example, the Amnesty International, you have Human Rights Watch, these are, are organizations that specialize in human rights activities and to save people from the activities of, 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 um, of, of bad government and, and human rights abuses. We have uh, NGOs that are into environment. So, for example, Greenpeace 
recently they were they were on the Arctic seas and all of those other areas, the Atlantic Ocean, you know, uh, fighting oil drilling companies that they are polluting the environment. If you go to Nigeria, the Ogoni area where there's a lot of pollution from oil activities, there are a lot of NGOs there that are fighting to make sure that the, the environment is not polluted. So you have NGOs in those areas as well. You have NGOs in governance. Uh, for example, in Ghana, you have IDEC, Institute for Democratic Governance. You have CDD, Center for Democratic Development. All of these are kinds of NGOs that help to develop democracy and, and all of that. So you would find that in, when we talk about the activities of NGOs, it spans across. So if you intend to, or as I keep encouraging you, if you have to establish your own NGO, you can look at anything that you think affects humanity, and you can specialize in that area and go ahead to establish your NGO in that area. So why are NGOs important? Maybe I should ask you to uh, begin to just pause your, your, your video and, and go through this exercise of trying to establish or list up to three or four uh, 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 importance of NGOs based on what we have been talking about now. I'm sure you are able to do that. So please, you know, pause your video, go ahead and establish or list up to four importance of NGOs. And let's come back and, and discuss what I have for you. Now let's continue. So we say that NGOs have a lot of functions that they perform. For example, NGOs are meeting a lot of global challenges. There are people who are crossing the, the ocean uh, as illegal immigrants into Europe, and they are dying, and you go there, and there are NGOs that are doing it, because this doesn't fall within a particular government's jurisdiction. So nobody cares, in fact. But you will find a lot of NGOs there, uh, people who are moving from Syria uh, and running away from the war. You see NGOs are there and helping to solve the problems of those people, providing services to the, to the poor and marginalized people who are trapped in war, children and women and all of that. So we say NGOs rise up to the challenge that face the, the globe um, in all aspects, uh, aspects of, of, of the world uh, or, or development. You can find NGOs there. NGOs enhance socioeconomic development of people. If you go to the north of Ghana, where I come from, for example, in many places, but for the, the work of NGOs, you will not have water, you will not have school, you will not have road, you will not have a hospital. NGOs help to, uh, to, to establish these things and help communities to keep functioning. So NGOs enhance the socioeconomic uh, development of the people. In fact, in many places, in, even in Ghana, you will not find the activities of government. And, but you will find NGOs there. You will find you know, all of these NGOs across the villages helping the communities and, and all of that. Um, NGOs are also noted to, to be very innovative. They, are, they go to communities and they, they try to solve the problems of the people in, in innovative ways. They use different approaches, approaches that are tried elsewhere. They use them. The NGOs assist communities and in many cases they provide public services. Now, these are some of the things that NGOs uh, uh, do that make them important. In many cases, we say that, as I, as I keep saying, if NGOs were not in many places in Ghana, the people would not be able to survive. I'll tell you a very little story. In the village that I was born in Yeji, uh, it's called Ajentrua. In that village, for many years, every time of the year, a, a specific time of the year, everybody there suffered from guinea worm. And many people could not uh, do their farm work during that time of the year because they have guinea worm. And, and for many years, we had thought that government was going to come there to help. Government didn't come. The local assembly didn't come. It took World well Vision to sink two boreholes in that community to help to support the people. And as I talk to you now, no one in that community suffers from Guinea worm. Now, that tells you the kind of work that NGOs will do. If we're waiting for government to come, perhaps we, people in that community will still be suffering. Uh, from the, the, the infestation of guinea worm. So that is the kind of role, that's, that's how important NGOs have become. And, and so we say that the role of NGOs in development is so important. Now, what I'm going to let you do is to go ahead, based on what we have just done, uh, for you to go ahead and, and identify some categories of NGOs and try to find out if you can identify the kind of activities that these NGOs are engaged in. You don't have to look very far. Just look at the district in which you are, the town in which you are, or the district in which you are, or the region in which you are. And then after that, you might want to escalate it to look at what happens in Ghana generally. And then beyond that, you can look at international, the international community. Start from where you know, and that helps you to make a lot of progress. Thanks very much for being with me on this uh, second session of our course management of NGOs. My name is Justice, and thanks for being with you. I will meet you again in session three, where we will take a look at another topic. Thank you very much.